I sing the body electric, wrote American poet Walt Whitman in 1855. Everyone was excited about electricity. This age is called Victorian after Queen Victoria, whose husband put on the industry show at the 1851 World's Fair Expo in London. For many hours in 1858, a series of failed struggles to string the Atlantic Ocean with a telegraph succeeded. The Queen's message across the Atlantic Ocean was the first. Not much later, that wire stopped working. Cable was the fancy word for the wire, because pure metals were wrapped in something a lot like rubber, but different. The Queen's first message traveled slowly, but that was a secret. People knew electricity traveled at about the speed of light, but was slowed down some or weakened. People realized it should be possible to get signals from one side of the ocean to the other side in seconds. That was so much faster than traveling on boats. In Europe and America, many expected the Atlantic Telegraph to change the world once it succeeded. It took quite a few tries. William Thompson, after his time as a student at Cambridge, England, was on the big ships that laid the telegraph wires down. In 1866, it made him famous when his team succeeded and he was the lead scientist on the project. Queen Victoria made him a knight, Sir William Thompson, because of its success. Whether Willie, William Thompson, Sir William Thompson, or Lord Kelvin, as he was later elevated, he became the famous face of science for the Victorian age on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. We met him before as one of the trio from Scotland who went to Cambridge and took the hard math test. Thompson's family had moved to Ireland for generations, but by the time he was a teenager, they were back in Scotland. Willie's smart dad taught himself math and became a respected teacher of higher degree. Imagine having a dad like that, keeping his eye on you every step of the way. Sir William, grown up, was often wrong, but he always tried. His math was always beautiful, and as he shared his thoughts, they were a joy for students and colleagues to watch. When he taught, his mind would wander and he would share. As we shall see, this made it seem like he was everywhere important science was being done. Of course, he could not really be everywhere. Papa Thompson taught higher math in Glasgow. Then Willie went to Cambridge, where we saw him before with Maxwell and Tate. Afterwards, and through much hard work by his father, William got a job teaching in Glasgow too, and always kept it, even 50 years later. He traveled to so many important meetings that he must have wished he could travel as fast as a telegraph signal. But no, and it was a long time before pictures were sent over long distances too. 
he had a lot of energy to go everywhere he did and to be available for people while doing his own regular work. He was a religious man, convinced God created the different kinds of plants and animals. He believed the world, our earth where we live, had been cooling for a very long time, but not long enough for the grandkids effect to have made all the different kinds of life we see. In other words, not long enough for Darwin's idea to work. The man who would become Lord Kelvin, the face of Victorian science in that age, believed many things that some Christians today believe too. Modern science calculates some of these numbers differently than the Bible. Victorian scientists who relied on the Bible in their daily lives did not let their math interfere with their faith. Stringing the cable from Europe to North America finally succeeded and stayed put in 1866. One of the cable boats that William rode on had been called Niagara, named after the mighty river separating the United States from Canada. Between a failed effort in 1857 and trying again in 1858, William's ability with math and science led him to make a neat invention. No one really understood why the telegraph's electric signal was so weak when it reached the far end, but William had the best math for it, thanks to the Frenchman Joseph Fourier's studies of heat. The idea in the math was like a race, with fast and slow vibes, starting in the same place, for example, in Europe. The vibes would go up and down and travel along the wire, sort of. Thomson's math had said the vibrations would get weaker, but at the far end they were even weaker than that. Twirling his monocle helped give Thompson his new idea. A monocle is like one eye's part of eyeglasses on a string or ribbon. Thompson would twirl his around. He was able to design a machine with a little mirror that twirled on a string like his monocle to detect even a very small electric signal. His friend Maxwell wrote a poem about it with the line, flow, current, flow, set the quick light spot flying. This twirly mirror that reacts to very little electricity was one of many things Thompson invented in his life. One year earlier, in 1865, Thompson's fellow Cambridge student Maxwell published one of his greatest papers on electricity and magnets. It is interesting today to consider that mostly people did not care. It was as if there was a contest for being one of the few people who could figure out what it meant. Nobody won that for a long time. So meet Oliver Heaviside the man who did. His family struggled to survive in London, but with his brother Arthur, he was lucky that a new uncle married into the family. Charles Wheatstone, one of the early telegraph inventors we mentioned at the Industry Expo. Wheatstone helped the young men get jobs as telegraphers. Arthur kept going and was a big success in the British government that controlled public telegraph messages. Oliver did the job for a while, but then went back to his room at home and stayed there. Another thing these telegraphers were called was electricians. A magazine called The Electrician came out every week 
and they usually let Oliver write articles for them, beginning in 1882. He would say lively and naughty things, and then use math almost no one could understand. Sometimes the magazine would have to put him on time out, because this was a wild combination. Naughty talk and mystery math, side by side. Oliver Heaviside eventually was accepted as being the best at reading Maxwell's book and figuring out what it meant. Too bad Oliver started a new contest for who in the world could understand the math and what he wrote. The weekly magazine The Electrician agreed to print his articles, and Heaviside got carried away. He would make fun of things in ways anyone could understand. Then his math was new and hard while he made it look easy for him. One of Ireland's greatest scientists was George Fitzgerald, and he became Oliver Heaviside's most important fan. He won the contest of understanding Oliver. Because so many people respected Fitzgerald, more and more people tried to understand Heaviside and got stumped. Oliver even came up with a way to do Maxwell without the Quaternions. Oliver called it his math machine. Heaviside made math work like a machine in the math of itself. He always said it was so much easier than Quaternions. He didn't think they were practical. Some people who loved quaternions really thought this was too much and just wrong, but other scientists and math experts thought it was cool. Some liked both. One man called Oliver the Walt Whitman of British Electricity Studies and said his articles were even better than poetry. Heaviside found a new and simpler way to do almost the same thing as Maxwell's own formulas. Actually, Oliver's math machine was only good if you knew what not to use it for and how not to use it, which drove math men mad. But let's go back to William Thompson's travels and see how the directions of Sir William and Oliver's lives crossed. Two notable journeys by Sir William to America, besides laying the telegraph cable, were in 1876 and in 1884. The first was at a fair in Philadelphia celebrating 100 years since 1776, and William was one of two judges for a new invention, the telephone. It was only 10 years since the cable had been laid across the Atlantic, and with better signals, it was possible to hear people's voices and what they had to say. These telephone signals could not reach other people anywhere in the world yet, the way they do now. Then the year 1884 had Thompson traveling south beyond Philadelphia to Baltimore where he gave a series of lectures at the school Johns Hopkins. Albert Michelson and Edward Morley were among the young scientists enjoying Thompson's questions and answers about the speed and nature of light. Later, they tried an experiment to measure it. The years from 1886 to 1893 and beyond were exciting and changed the world into the age we now live in. In the German city Karlsruhe, young Heinrich Hertz began two years of experiments that shook England. The country of France took pride in creating great monuments, the Statue of Liberty, now in New York City Harbor, as well as the Eiffel Tower, which was created to soar 
above Paris's 1889 World's Fairgrounds and remains a symbol of Paris to this day. By 1898, its high tower was used to send radio waves to a church more than two miles away, a dramatic first test for wireless technology, and its structure was used for many more science experiments. Within the tower, there is a list of 72 names that France takes special pride in. Thomson's hero Fourier is just one of the amazing minds on that list, which includes Lavoisier, as well as math men who traveled with Napoleon. In 1887, Michelson and Morley went to great lengths to perform the best measurement of the speed of light possible. They had a mirror that twirled and sent the light two different ways, so they felt sure they could find a difference in how the light traveled. They failed. Their results seemed to show that light went the same speed no matter what. Since this result did not make sense at the time, everyone was sure it was a failure. In 1887, Oliver Heaviside published his article in The Electrician, explaining how a cable such as the Atlantic Telegraph could send better signals by breaking up the distance every so often with a kind of magnetic boost. This unexpected way the whole thing worked was upsetting to Sir William Thompson, who never really agreed with the way his Cambridge friend Maxwell thought about electricity anyway. Before Oliver published the article, he wrote a letter reaching out to Sir William with revealing information about his research. The year 1888 gave Sir William a great shock. George Fitzgerald was joined by Oliver Lodge, writing about Oliver's math machine in The Electrician, and both men liked Heaviside's approach. It made Maxwell's math so much simpler. In many ways, Oliver made the formulas we think of as Maxwell's, because it is the simpler ones that are used all the time. While on a train in Germany in 1888, Oliver Lodge read about Heinrich Hertz's latest experiments. The news of Hertz's result was soon to be Thompson's shock, and Lodge must have known when he first read the results that they would shake British science. He decides electricity treats a wire as a guide, but the electricity's power is mostly in the space around the wire. Like the power of magnets, because they are a pair, electricity goes up and down and up and down in vibes, fast and slow. Hertz was handy and could make metal experiments and glass containers. He began with a spark in an electric circuit, and then added another one to make a bigger circuit. Then he split them apart and found that the vibe signal could be picked up after it traveled through space, guided into a metal loop from the air. Depending on the size of the loop and its spark balls, the spark in the sender could control when the spark for the message happened. The fast vibes are shorter and the slow ones take longer. When the loop is a match for the size of the vibe, the connection is much stronger. This was the beginning of radio. Lodge must have smiled to himself on the train, thinking what a big deal the news of Hertz's experiment would be. It was. 
later in 1888 at england's town of bath george fitzgerald opened the meeting of the british association with sir william thompson and oliver lodge in attendance he explained the Hertz experiments Lodge had read about on the train. Lodge also presented some experiments of his own. These experiments were believed to confirm Maxwell's ideas about electric power moving through space in a way Heaviside described, but Sir William had missed. Thompson even began reading his friend Maxwell's big book, more carefully, and occasionally asking Fitzgerald questions about it. The world was changing. 1888 was also the year at Vassar that Maria Mitchell passed the school's telescope duties on to the scientist who began as her pupil, Mary Watson Whitney. Beginning in 1889, thanks to his conversations with Lodge, George Fitzgerald had a thought about Michelson and Morley's experiment trying to measure the speed of light. He published on it a bit, then Lodge referred to it in print, and another scientist came up with the same thing on his own. It was the idea that maybe how long things were changed if they were going fast enough. Basically, the things that were being measured in the experiment when light traveled could be changing on their own somehow as far as how they were measured. This idea became important later. Also in 1889, during one of Sir William Thompson's big speeches, he declared Oliver Heaviside had special abilities when it came to math and electricity, a pat on the back that the world noticed. The Chicago World's Fair in 1893 was a remarkable height of its own. The city had grown, connecting America's Great Lakes to its railroads, and Chicago went all out to show off in 1893. Ellen Swallow had finally gotten paid work, consulting for the industry man Edward Atkinson, and they went to the fair together to show off the oven they designed. Just the flame of a single oil lamp was enough to cook a meal, slowly, by containing the lamp's heat in this oven's container, called Aladdin's oven, because its power was a single oil lamp. This World's Fair also was the time when it became clear how America's electricity would become more available for people and industry. The fair's electricity pavilion had a statue of Ben Franklin at its entrance. As an expert on electricity himself, working for Britain, Oliver Heaviside's brother, Arthur, was in Chicago at the fair too. The company Westinghouse had an electricity exhibit with its engineer Nikola Tesla's designs. These powered the fair itself. It was a big deal because Thomas Edison did a lot more than invent the light bulb and the phonograph. Edison made a system for sending electricity out from a central station. His signal took away the bottom part of the vibe where the electricity finishes going down and starts going up. Edison's design was good for telling machines whether to do more or less because the electricity was just more power or less power. Tesla's design started with the Vibe's whole shape and made it easier to send power over long distances. This power signal could be cleaned and filtered into Edison's direct electricity after the power got where it needed to go. The next step for electric power was Niagara Falls, and by 1890, Sir William Thompson was already consulting on an electricity project to harness its natural power. Not many years later, America's first really large central electricity plant for people in industry 
was built nearby Niagara Falls, made by the Westinghouse Company. In another of Thompson's examples of being wrong, he announced that using Tesla's whole vibe for central power was a mistake. It was not. Edison's group hired the most brilliant math man for electricity, who was at the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. His name was Charles Steinmetz, and he took Heaviside's ideas a step further. As the Edison Group became General Electric, it continued to compete with Westinghouse for projects and sales. Like the telegraph company becoming the phone company, these growing firms needed expert scientists to do the kind of business they were in. Industry had moved from the show in London in 1851 to an electric power plant capturing the energy of Niagara Falls and its descending water. The falls are on the same Niagara River that Thompson's boat in 1857 was named after as he struggled against failure to connect Europe electrically with America. <laughs>